Well, hello everyone and welcome back to another video teaching going along with our Fear Free Year Bible Study. This is a Bible study where we've been taking a look at all the different verses in the Bible which are instructive to us on how to live without fear and worry and anxiety in our present day and age. And we've been methodically working through these verses. We're on week 50, so we're getting down to the wire and we've seen a lot. And some of the Fear Free verses have been confusing and some of them have been straightforward. And today is going to be one of those days that you don't want to miss because it is a straightforward fear-free verse which really goes right to the heart of the matter about why you do not have to fear. So we are going to go into the New Testament this week into 1 Peter chapter 5 and I'm going to read a whole paragraph and in it I mean honestly I don't even know that this paragraph needs teaching on, but um, it just needs to be read and heard and, and received. And I'm going to read it. And of course, I will teach a little bit along the way, but just dive in with me to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6. And we're going to get great instruction, including just a powerful fear-free verse. All right. So here we are, verse 6 of 1 Peter chapter 5. Humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Now I'm going to stop there just to teach and say, whenever you see a therefore, you know, the common Christian thing to say is, you know, you want to know what the therefore is there for. And with that, you kind of want to go to a verse before and just read about it. So you can see what the continuation of the thought is coming from. So in this case, the continuation of the thought you know, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, comes from the verse before, which says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And there you have a great reason to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. It's, it's um, you know, if you think about it, that's a hard thing to do. It's a, it's a hard thing to do with people, and it's certainly a hard thing to do with God. Um, if somebody has got power over you. It's, it's very hard to humble yourself under their mighty hand because it's a risk. You know, you are allowing yourself to be very vulnerable with somebody who has a lot of power over you. And in this case, we're talking about God Almighty, the mighty hand of God, which has the ability to crush you, you know, to send you to hell, um, to do terrible things and to do great things for you. The mighty hand of God, the omnipotent, uh, all-powerful hand of God. The scriptures are saying, humble yourself under him because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So a, a great reason to humble yourself under the, the mighty, all-powerful hand of God that could you know, do all kinds of <laughs> terrible things to you or great things to you. When your Bible says that God opposes the proud, uh, but gives grace to the humble, it's really saying, you know, God is going to turn away from you if you are proud. If you are someone who thinks they can do everything on their own because they're so strong and they're so capable and they're so smart and they've done things for themselves their whole lives. If, if that is your thought process, you are living in an air of pride that I am doing this. I am the one that's making my way in the world. I am the one who got my job and worked hard at school and uh, worked on the relationship. I did it. Those are all very prideful thoughts and God opposes that. God gives grace to those who are humble meaning God la la lavishes onto you unmerited favor when you take the stance of humility. Unmerited favor. You don't deserve it, but God gives you favor. Again, the all-powerful, mighty hand of God giving grace to you, giving things to you that you don't deserve because you are humbling yourself and saying, I can't do it, God. I can't do it. I haven't done anything on my own and I don't want to do anything on my own. I want you to do it for me. I want you to stand beside me. I want you to be my guide. I want you to be my rear guard, my front guard on both sides of me. I need you, God. 
your Bible would say that, that there is nothing, nothing good that comes to you that doesn't pass through the hands of God. So there's nothing that you're doing on your own. You, you are not breathing on your own right now. You are not reproducing the cells in your body right now. You are doing zero. And so you just got to get it in your mind. That's the first step to humility that really you have no control. You have no control over your bodily functions and your, your body continuing on and you have no control over what happens at your work tomorrow and what happens when you get in your car tomorrow or what happens in your relationship tomorrow or your health tomorrow. You have no control. So you might as well humble yourself and take that stance which says, I, I'm not doing anything and God is doing it all and God is giving me He's lavishing on me unmerited favor, things I don't even deserve because I'm taking the position of humility and saying, God, you're my leader. God, you're the one that's doing everything, okay? So he opposes the proud and gives grace to those who are humble. So that's what is going on in the first verse there, verse six. And then it goes on to say, um, Humble yourself under the mighty God, hand of God so that at the proper time he might exalt you. So not even, you know, just stopping at giving you unmerited favor, but now exalting you, lifting you up above whatever it is around you that you might feel is keeping you down. So God has that power to lift up your head. The Bible would say, I think it's in... Um, Psalm 3.3, you know, the Lord is the lifter of my head. And that comes from the times where there were kings. And you might remember this from the, the time of Joseph, uh, when the baker and the, the one who was the wine taster, uh, they went to the king, the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh lifted one's head and didn't lift the other, the other's head. The, the lifter of your head, the one who has the ability to lift your head and look at you straight in the face and, and um, listen to your request, that is God. He has the ability to exalt you, to lift you up, to bring you out of the mire, to bring you up to your feet, to listen to what you're you've been pleading for, praying for, and to grant those things, to lavish unmerited favor on you. This is what being humble in under the mighty hand of God does for you. So plenty of really, really good reason to humble yourself and to take that mindset that you are not under, you're not in control. No matter how much you think you are, you are not at all. And when you humble yourself, these great things happen for you as far as the spiritual realm goes. But now we get into our fear-free verse, which says, uh, I, this is verse seven, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And then we could sum up our fear-free year just in that fear-free verse. Why is it that you should cast all your anxieties on God, right? You're, you're anxious, you're out of control. The world is spinning all around you. You've humbled yourself. You're putting yourself in the hands of God. You're, you're saying, God, you have to do this. This is the next step. You're also saying, you're pleading out. You're saying, I'm worried about this, God. This is vulnerable for me. I'm turning my life over to you. I'm asking you to be the one that does everything for me, that leads me and guides me into all good things according to your will. It's a, it's a humble place and it's a uh, vulnerable place. So the next bit of it is our fear free verse. Cast your anxieties on to God. And you do that because he cares for you. You have the creator of everything on your side. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you're somebody who believes what happened on the cross, that Jesus came and he died for your sin, and with that, you've been forgiven of all your sin and wiped clean, and you will resurrect on your on your dying day, your spirit is gonna go straight to the face-to-face -face presence of, of Jesus and eventually your resurrected body is gonna raise from the dead. Meanwhile, you've become born again with the spirit of God. If you believe all of that, 
you have a God who cares for you. Now, does God care for everybody? Absolutely. The offer of belief in Jesus is going out to the entire world. He cares for humanity. He created everybody and he cares for everybody. So yes, you know, God the Father cares about everybody. But if you have become a Christ follower, his care for you is now a family thing. You've become part of the family of God. When you've become born again of the Spirit of God, you are included in God's family tree. You have the Spirit of God Almighty living in you. And now it's come from just, I care about you because I created to you, to I care about you because I gave my son to purchase your soul so that you would be me, with me in the family of God in heaven forever. It's a whole different level of care. This is a personal care. The Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit is living in you. He cares about you that much that he's housed within your body. And so this is a whole different level of care above and beyond, I created you. So yes, God the Father, he cares for everybody because he created everybody. He's beckoning everybody to come to believe in Jesus. But those people who have become Christ followers, it's a whole different level of care. You know what God did for you. God in Abad, Jesus Christ splayed himself on the cross and endured the wrath of Almighty God that you deserved. He did that for you. He cares about you that much that if you were the only person on this planet, he would have walked to that cross just for you, to have you eternally with him in heaven. So that's a whole different level of care. And I hope you have received the gift of belief in Jesus Christ for your salvation um, and that you are wrapping your head around the level of care that goes along with this because you can then cast all of your anxieties onto God and know how much he cares for you. If he cared about you so much that he did not pull himself off that cross and say, I'm done with the torture, then how much more does he care about you now in your day-to-day -day thing, which is a little thing compared to the fact that he had to die for your sin, right? It's just impossible. Romans 8 would say that you, you can't separate yourself from the love of God. So God cares for you in such a huge way that you can know that you can cast all your anxieties on him and he will care for your fears. He's not going to yell at you because your faith is weak and say, how can you be afraid of this? Don't you know that I love you? That is not the heart of our God. He will care for you in the middle of your anxiety. All right. I'm going to keep going because it's still great instruction here that I want you to hear. Verse eight says, be sober minded and be watchful. Right, be sober minded. It doesn't mean like you have to just be like, you know, just serious all the time, sober minded. It just means consider how serious the situation is here, the spiritual battle that's going on all around us. Don't don't take things lightly because uh be sober minded, be watchful, because your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now that is frightening. And if you had any doubt in your mind that there is a devil and um, Satan and evil, an evil being, a spiritual being, a created being who is alive and active on this planet, um, that should put all that to rest. There is a Satan, the devil, and he is prowling around like a roaring lion. He's making quite a fuss trying to scare you um, and he's doing that to you if you're a believer um, and he's prowling around looking for somebody to devour. Now you might think to yourself, okay, how is it that Satan, as a um, me as a believer, how can Satan devour me, right? Aren't I safe from hell and all of that? But you certainly are. Satan is not the one that sends you to hell anyway. Satan is the one that's trying to tempt you. Um, he's trying to get those people who don't believe in Jesus to continue to not believe in Jesus. But um, as far as a believer goes, what Satan is trying to do is get you to sin. 
He's trying to devour you in that way, trying to get you to keep your eyes focused on anything else other than Jesus. Devour you spiritually, your spiritual walk. Does that mean if you're a believer that you're going to go to hell if you slip up and sin as a believer? No, but it just means that he will devour your effectiveness for the kingdom of God. Right now, if you are an all-in Christ follower, you've got a mission. You might not know it, but you've got one. I'll give you one, just so in case you don't know one, let me give you one. You have a mission to spread the gospel. You are on this planet with the Holy Spirit of God living in you on mission to tell other people about Jesus. And Satan is prowling around right now like a roaring lion trying to distract you, right? Roar, roar, roar. You, your eyes go here, your eyes go there because of all the whatever chaos around you. And what you've done is taken your eyes off of Jesus and off of your mission for him. You might have other callings and missions along with that, but that's just one of the others that you might have your your the great commission to go spread the gospel and that is what satan is trying to do so be sober-minded be watchful when things start going on around you uh, and they are distracting you get yourself back on track get yourself serious in your mind about what's going on because there is spiritual warfare going on all around you and it's trying to distract you from your hopefully ever growing walk with Jesus, ever uh, growing personal relationship with Jesus. That is what Satan can do to you right now. And, and I'll tell you, uh, if he does it to you, there might be somebody who God had a mission for you to go to share the gospel with or, sh or shine the light to, and you've been so distracted that you haven't gotten around to it. So please be sober-minded, be watchful, because your enemy is trying to devour you and stop your spiritual walk and your spiritual mission. Resist him. This is verse 9. Resist him firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So now we're talking about all the distractions of suffering and struggle and the economy and your health and your relationship and your job and everything around you is lit on fire and crumbling to the ground. Just know that all around the world there is suffering just like you're going through. Nobody promises a Christ follower a smooth ride. In fact, your Bible is very clear that if you come to know the Lord Jesus, you will suffer in the same way that Jesus did. And Jesus suffered in every way. He was alone. He was beaten. He was uh, abandoned by his friends. He um, witnessed people die. He lived a human existence and he went through all of the suffering that humans do. He was never tempted. Uh, he was never, um, he never sinned, but he was tempted even in the same way that humans are. So he suffered. He suffered. He, uh, Satan tried to distract him and devour him too. So he's been through all of this and know that all of the believers all over the world, the ones that came before us and the ones that are going to come after us, every one of them is going to suffer in some way. And the key to this is don't let the suffering that's going on around you keep your eyes off of Jesus. Know that everybody around the world who's a Christ follower is going through suffering. It's not an easy walk. And so you're in good company, the brotherhood of believers, the, the saints, the family of God, we suffer and we suffer because our savior suffered and we're following him in all the ways. And that's just one of the ways. It doesn't mean that you're gonna be beaten and scourged and crucified, but it means that there's gonna be pain in your life. Not necessarily physical pain, but maybe emotional pain or spiritual pain or relational pain or monetary pain or physical pain. So suffering comes with the territory and you can know that everybody around the world is experiencing the same suffering. But verse 10 says, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, the God who lavishes things on you that you don't deserve, right? Nobody said that you don't deserve suffering. I mean, suffering is, it just is what it is. But the God of all grace is going to lavish on you things you don't deserve. So he's going to, um, it says, after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, 
who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. So he's called you to uh, being with God the Father in glory forever in Christ. That is your promise. He's called you to that. He will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What kind of amazing grace is that? That God promises you that after you've been through whatever you're going through on this planet, this light and momentary affliction, 2 Corinthians would say, after you've done, you've, you've gotten <laughs> done with it, that the suffering after some time, Christ, God, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So there is a great promise to you now. Will it happen on this earth? I don't know. But I know that he, in glory, will do these things. He'll restore you. Everything in your life that's imperfect will be made perfect in glory. Confirm. He will confirm you. He'll say, you, you passed the test. You, you made it through. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to build you up for the next challenge, whatever it is. If it is on this earth, he's going to strengthen you on this earth to get into the next thing, whatever it is. Maybe it's suffering. Maybe it's a great thing. But he's going to strengthen you for the next thing, the next plan, the next mission. And he will establish you, firmly established. There's nothing like it, I will tell you, when you're suffering. It establishes your faith. I mean, if you let it. <laughs> you can let it take you away or you can you can let it establish you. You can you can walk away from your suffering or live through your suffering and say to yourself and to others, I don't care what is thrown at me. I am not going to stop following the Lord Jesus Christ. I am establishing my firm footing as a believer. Nothing is going to shake me from my walk with Jesus and my goal of becoming more and more like him. God will ensure through your suffering, after it's gone on a little while, that he's going to establish you on a, just think about it like you've gone to the next step. You're climbing a mountain and that mountain is at the top of it is you're looking more and more like Jesus and you've gotten yourself to the next step step on the climb and you're established there because of what you've been through during your time of suffering so it's a beautiful promise those those things that god will do for you restore you confirm you strengthen you establish you and verse 11 says to him be the dominion forever and ever amen to him be the dominion forever to him be control of everything forever he has dominion over everything, in case you didn't know it. It might feel like Satan is winning right now, um, but he's not. Um, he's already been hamstrung by our Lord when, when Jesus died on the cross. Satan was defeated, and so God has dominion over all this. Nothing is escaping him, nothing that's going on in your life, and nothing that's going on around, around you or in the government or anywhere on this planet. God is in control. So I encourage you to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and allow him to just lavish grace upon you because he will oppose you if you're proud, but he will draw near to you if you're humble. And um, if you keep your eyes focused on him, just keep that walk steady. Keep looking at him. Even though Satan is roaring around trying to distract you, just keep your walk steady keep going forward and let god establish you in your next step towards christ likeness and um, the next step in your mission for him all right hope that's helpful a great passage in our bibles uh, awesome one and uh, anyway it's all in jesus name i'm doing this all and i'll see you next time bye now